Welcome, this is the uh, next video in our series looking at Module 1A, which is going to provide a review of the Introduction to Cognitive Psychology chapter um, in your text. Um, and for this particular video, we're going to be looking at the work of Ebbinghaus and his uh, Forgetting Curve. Okay, so I'm going to begin our discussion of Ebbinghaus with an example that should be uh, familiar to at least some of you. Right? So let's suppose that you are planning to apply to a graduate program, right? So, so some kind of master's or PhD program. And the programs you're looking at require you to take the GRE exam, right? So the GRE exam is very, very similar to the SAT exam that you took uh, before applying to college. Um, and one of the sections in the GRE is going to be a vocabulary section or a verbal learning section that requires vocabulary. Right? So you decide that you're going to use uh, whatever free time you have this summer to try and uh, study for the GRE verbal section. So you look at your calendar and say, okay, I'm going to try to set aside some time every night to studying. And you even go so far as to purchase some vocabulary flashcards um, from Kaplan uh, to sort of kickstart your study session. Okay, so let's say that you sit down with your vocabulary flashcards on Monday night. And it takes you about 30 minutes to learn all of the flashcards. Right? So after 30 minutes um, for each of your flashcards, uh, you're able to successfully say the definition. Right? So you have learned them all completely in about 30 minutes. Okay? Well, let's suppose you decide to do the same thing on Tuesday night. So you take the same uh, pack of flashcards that you had before and this time, it only takes you 22 minutes to go through them and to be able to recite all of the definitions correctly, right? So what this shows, right, is that your prior learning episode or your prior uh, study session, right, the study session you had on Monday night, allowed you to effectively save eight minutes, right? Or you uh, basically learned the same uh, stack of cards in uh, eight less minutes than it took you to learn it originally, right? So in a sense, that savings from the first study session to the second study session is an index, a quantifiable index of what you remember, right? But let's suppose that on Wednesday, your best friend is having her 21st birthday party, right? So you decide to skip studying on Wednesday. Um, so you come back to your cards on Thursday. And this time it takes you about 27 minutes to learn the cards, right? So you still have some savings. You're still saving yourself about three minutes. Right? But it's not quite as good as the savings that you had that first day with the 22 minute or the eight minute savings, right? Um, so why am I showing you this? Well, um, because this example is very, very similar to what uh, Ebbinghaus showed in his studies, right? So who was Ebbinghaus? Well, 120 miles from Leipzig, um, there was a German psychologist, and by the way, Leipzig is significant because the University of Leipzig was where the first ever uh, psychological research study was conducted by uh, Wilhelm Wundt, so we'll talk about him in our next video on structuralism. Um, but in any case, at the University of Berlin, uh, German psychologist Hermann Ebbinghaus was using another approach to properly measure properties of the mind, 
Okay, so remember we talked about Francius Donders and how uh, he used his reaction time experiments um, to make inferences about mental processes, in this case, decision making. Um, well, Ebbinghaus was also looking at behavior as a means to make inferences about a mental process, but in this case, he was inferring something about memory. Okay. So Ebbinghaus was interested in determining specifically um, how rapidly information is lost over time. So he wanted to plot a time course of forgetting. So in order to do this, um, Ebbinghaus first had to come up with his own set of materials, right? So a lot of times in contemporary experiments studying memory, we take things like uh, ordinary word lists. Right, so we have people study a list of words like um, book and chair and harpsichord and things like that. Or we might have them read uh, passages from a textbook. Um, but those aren't always the best measures of, are the best materials to use um, because they involve having a prior association with something. Right? So if you have any experience with uh, those particular words, right, then those are going to influence, that experience is going to influence what you remember. So Ebbinghaus wanted to create uh, basically the purest uh, materials or the purest measure of memory that he could. And so he decided to use what he called nonsense syllables. So these were basically three letter words um, that were basically non-words, um, but had the same phonetic properties of words, right? So for example, dax or lem, right? Those are pronounceable like words, right? Um, but they have no meaning attached to them, which means we have no prior association with them. Um, so it's basically the purest uh, memory probe uh, that he could get, right? Because there's no, there's no prior association. We have no uh, prior learning or memory of this information. Okay. So uh, what Ebbinghaus did is he used what's called a memory drum. And that was just in, in kind of an old fashioned apparatus that would display the each each item or each uh, nonsense syllable uh, and then he would turn the drum and it would turn over and another word would appear so again it's basically just uh, another uh, kind of old old time apparatus that that took the place of of what we now uh, use computers for so what Ebbinghaus did is he would view lists of these nonsense syllables that he had created. Um, so most of his lists were comprised of about 13 nonsense syllables. So he would view a series of nonsense syllables. And then he would repeat the list and he would try to predict the next nonsense syllable that would appear in the list until he could remember all of the nonsense syllables in the correct order, right? So just like when we're studying flashcards, right? We look at a word and try to recall the definition on the back, right? He would look at an existing nonsense syllable and try to remember which nonsense syllable came after it until he could recite them all from memory in the in the correct order okay so he would do that until he could recite them all in the correct order um, and what he did is he kept track of how long it took him right so how long did it take him uh, to be able to learn that list of nonsense syllables and be able to recite them in the correct order 
then he would do the same exact thing after some kind of delay. So what did Ebbinghaus do with this information? Um, well, he basically did the same thing um, that I worked uh, through with you guys um, in, the, in the first example. Um, so he compared the time that it took him to first learn the list to the time it took him to relearn the list after a delay. And that gave him his savings score, right? Um, so just like it took you guys in our example, 30 minutes the first time you studied the flashcards um, and 22 minutes the second time you uh, studied the flashcards, flashcards 24 hours later, right? Um, your savings in that case would be a savings of eight minutes. And the saving score reflects the quantitative index or uh, quantitative measure of what you remember, right? Um, so that's what Ebbinghaus did uh, using his nonsense syllables, right? Um, so for in this example, in uh, as shown by the blue bars, um, it took him uh, 1,000 seconds to initially learn this list of nonsense syllables. And then he waited 19 minutes before attempting to relearn the list. And he was able to relearn the list um, in about 400 seconds, right? So his savings was about 600 seconds. Um, but what he noticed is that as the delay or as the time between the first learning episode and the subsequent learning episode increased, his savings score decreased, right? So as the delay got longer, uh, the, the savings got smaller, basically, right? So um, initially, uh, in, that, in the first graph, his savings was about 600, but when the delay increased from 19 minutes to 24 hours, right, that savings dropped from a savings of 600 to a savings of 350 seconds, right? So just like you guys in the previous example, first you saved uh, um, about eight minutes, right? But then after you skipped one study session and your delay increased from 24 hours to 48 hours, right? That savings decreased from eight minutes to three minutes, right? Ebbinghaus saw the same thing, right? So as the delay increased, his savings decreased. Uh, but one of the interesting things that Ebbinghaus observed is that there was a rapid loss of savings uh, initially, right? So initially, as the delay increased from 19 minutes to 24 hours, um, there was almost a 50% drop, right? A drop from 600 to 350, right? But as the delay moved from one day to six days, uh, that loss slowed down considerably or leveled off. Right? So it only jumps from 350 second savings at one day to 270 uh, uh, seconds um, at six days. Right? So the general pattern, if we were to plot the time course of forgetting, is that initially there's a rapid decrease in savings as the delay increases. But eventually, that decrease in savings levels off. Okay? Um, so again, what is significant about this? Well, it doesn't matter what materials you're learning, whether they're uh, nonsense syllables, vocabulary words, what have you. Um, anytime you measure your uh, savings as a function of delay, you're going to see that same pattern of First, there's going to be a rapid decrease in savings, and then it's going to level off. 
right? That's true of everyone, regardless of the materials that you use. Um, and we can plot that time course for anyone. Um, and that particular pattern is referred to as a forgetting curve. Um, the other significant thing about this is Ebbinghaus's contribution in terms of cognitive psychology. So he joins uh, Francius Donders in being one of the first people to effectively use a behavioral response as an index for a mental response, right? So he could look at um, the uh, quantifiable index of savings, um, which is an observable measure um, of something unobservable, which is memory, okay? Um, so like uh, Francius Donders looked at reaction time as a proxy for the internal cognitive process of decision-making, um, Ebbinghaus looked at uh, savings, which is a quantifiable index of memory, okay? So we're using behavioral index, uh, uh, indices or measures um, to tell us something about mental processes, okay? All right, so I'll see you guys in the next video. Feel free to contact me if you have questions.